Hello, I'm Marshall Shore, Arizona's hip historian. Today I'm joined by the Arizona State Capitol because it was recently proclaimed online to be the ugliest state capitol in America. How did that make you feel? It makes me feel mad and upset. I'm over 115 years old, older than the state itself, and those folks at that list took a pick of my bum and called it ugly. Though I've had some work done, I don't feel that they were correct nor very polite. You know, Capital, you're looking quite dapper today. <laughs> well, thank you, hip historian. I'm a humble Capital, nothing too fancy. I'm all about local. My foundation that keeps me standing here was carved from our own nearby landmark, Camelback Mountain. My top came from Yavapai County, and the ground level is granite from South Mountain. But I have to boast about my copper top. It was old and dinged up. The wonderful youth across Arizona saved their pennies to buy me a new shiny copper dome. <laughs> Thank you. Who's with you today? My children, the House and Senate. See, Arizona has grown a lot over the years. Instead of moving or getting rid of me and getting something new and fancy, they were added as needed. Some call them too modern, lacking class, but they are children of their era and show how we've grown since my territorial days. Do you like it when people come to visit? Oh, of course. I adore visitors. We're the home by and for the people. You can even get a tour of all four floors and hear the stories that make Arizona's history great. Well, good evening, everyone. Oh my gosh, I want to welcome you to our December 3rd episode of Arizona History Happy Hour. We have been doing this now for, th this is the 33rd show we've been doing on this lovely day of December 3rd, where actually there was a bit of chill in the air. Um, some of you are watching on Facebook, YouTube, and even Twitch. So I want to welcome you all. We have a great show for you this evening. We're going to be talking about a wide variety of things. Now, this show is made possible because of donations from folks like you out there. No amount is too small. Now, we do have also support from AARP, and they have a message in that if you're looking for ways to stay healthy, active, and informed without leaving home, AARP Arizona has lots of online offerings and virtual get-togethers. Find out all the ways you can click to connect with your community at arp.org slash near you. And you can find a whole host of different programs and things that they are doing virtually to keep people healthy. So what can you expect in this show? Well, for this December 3rd, we're actually focusing on December 1st or World AIDS Day. And so what you can expect is we're going to do some trivia. I have a special guest, of course. We do have a little bit of a cocktail. Well, so not so much as a cocktail as a glass of wine, a little bit of music history, as well as some show and tell. So if this is your first time here. You might be wondering, who is that man on my screen? Well, you know, tell you a little bit about myself. So a little over 20 years ago, I was living and working in Brooklyn, actually at a lovely little Carnegie Library. Well, not necessarily so little, but you know, winter had gotten me down and I was ready for a change. So decided up to pack everything and move to Phoenix, Arizona. I was working as Central City South, 
just south of downtown in what was a 1950s library, the first branch library for Phoenix Public. And there was this rich oral tradition of the community. And I realized that that wasn't really happening in a lot of other communities. So I really just started listening to people and retelling their stories and then going off and researching and adding more to those. And that got me to where I am today. Now to get here, we actually loaded everything we own into a big orange cube, a U-Haul. And you know, they have the world international headquarters right here in the Valley of the Sun. And we promptly moved into a 1956 ranch. When we moved in, it was originally multi shades of beige. I'm happy to say now it is seafoam and cantaloupe. Just a lovely little two tone of a house. Now the house is pretty much original. In fact, that's what my kitchen looks like today. All that buttercream yellow tile, the matching yellow in the wall oven with no window. And if you look at my stovetop, the push buttons are actually inset in the wall. So we try to keep the house to about 1964, 65. So it really is a time capsule onto itself. Now, when I got here, all I kept hearing about how there was no history here. And I knew that wasn't true because every time I went for an adventure, whether it was on foot, on bike, in a car, I came across so many amazing stories about people, places, and events. And so again, I started retelling those. And then you have what I think in a lot of ways made the Arizona that we know and love today, that all that post-war boom, all those GIs that either has stationed here, trained here, or passed through on the way to somewhere else. And after the war, they were moving here in huge numbers. And in some cases, looking for a house just like mine. And then there's this man, Dr. Carrier the inventor of air conditioning. Not that we necessarily needed him on a day like today, but you might remember last week when we did need him and he changed how we interact with the environment and change it did. Now, my name is Marshall Shore. I'm also known around town as the hip historian. You might wonder, how does one get a name like the hip historian? Well, you know, back on February 14th of 2012, we were celebrating statehood, but not just any statehood. There had been events across the state for 100 years of Arizona becoming a state. And so they did an amazing stage and event down at the state capitol. And someone gave me 15 minutes to talk about whatever I wanted to. And I chose to talk about an event that was called Mask of the Yellow Moon that ran from 1926 to 1955. At its height, it had about 5,000 high school and college students performing and presenting. It was touted right there with Mardi Gras as something that everybody in the country should go see. And so I was lucky enough to find three dresses in boxes and able to convince three of my friends to don those. Now, there is another gentleman some of you may have heard of, Marshall Trimble, who is the official state historian. And somebody was trying to introduced me to someone else and they kept confusing me with Marshall Trimble and they said, oh, he's the hip historian. And I immediately said, thank you so much. I am stealing that moniker. And since that time, I have been indeed the hip historian. Now, before a moment of COVID, I was doing a variety of tours and lectures, which have pretty much come to a screeching halt. And that's really why I started doing this happy hour because I realized when you share stories with people, they share stories back. And I was really missing that component because some of my best material actually comes from people just sharing their random memories. And so hopefully, I mean, we've done some tours in the past. I know with the new year coming up, we'll be doing um, some wa a walking tour of downtown. Everyone is fully masked. There'll be more information about that. Now, if you'd like to reach out during the show, you can always reach out. Um, there is a chat session. You can join that. You can also join me on Facebook, which is Marshall Shore Hip Historian, or even Instagram. Oh, and I just put myself on TikTok. I haven't done anything on TikTok, but soon I'll be able to put AZ Hip Historian up there as my moniker.
Now, if you're watching on Facebook, I will ask you to click on that little share button down beneath so that everyone can see how much fun we're having. And you can share that with all of your friends. And because it is happy hour, um, I had have my cocktail advisor, PJ, who is with the Valley Ho. And so every week he comes up with an amazing bit of history that I can share. And so today, let's see. All right. Oops. Let's do that. And so today we are enjoying a lovely Beaujolais. And so this is actually the same label that Elton John served at his big fundraiser back in February. So it is the same label and a lovely glass of red wine. Oh, that was a very healthy pour. All right. So it'll be a good night this evening. All right. So a little bit of show and tell because, you know, I have a house full of stuff. And for me, I mean, being a librarian and now kind of a historian slash storyteller, everything has a story. And so this green backpack, which doesn't really go with anything that I really own pretty much anymore, but on the back of it, is a little piece of black fabric that has been on here since the late 80s. Um, back when I was in college at Purdue University, I was looking for a way to get myself to Washington, D.C. to see what was touted as the last complete viewing of the AIDS quilt at that point. And I was able to actually hitch a ride with a sign language club. And so we all went to D.C., and I got into Gallaudet University and all kinds of things. And I also did make it to the AIDS quilt. And this is a strip of fabric that they would put down beneath the quilt and the ground. And so as they were moving things, they would always give out strips of that fabric. And so that's where that came from. Oh, and there's actually the quilt on display in D.C., as you can kind of get an idea of the magnitude of it. And we'll talk a little bit more about what it represents in just a moment. Now, through the miracle of modern technology, I am happy to say we are going to be bringing on my friend Dave as we get a chance to talk about why this week is so special. Hey, Dave. Hey, Marshall. I love that shirt that you're wearing. Look at that. Look at that. Selfless Center. Yay. Oh, and, lo and you even have one of your own stickers on. I do have a little friendly sticker on there. You do. So, Dave, tell us about yourself. Hi. Well, uh, my name is Dave Watt, and I am the outreach manager here at Southwest Center. And as of this week, I am here in Phoenix for a year. So, I moved here from Michigan. So, like you, I'm originally from New York, but hey, this desert life for me. Oh, love it. No show to, I mean, no snow to shovel, which is great. Oh, and um, I'm also the founder of this little this little campaign. It's the Friendly Campaign. It's a plus and a minus sign on a smiling face. And it's been around for about 12 years. I just came up with that concept just in my years of decades. Whoa, decades. Whoa, decades of work in uh, HIV. Um, I just wanted to create campaigns that um, were um, based on a smiling face, just not fear-based languaging and making sure we focus on uh, people uh, living with HIV and also people um, at risk for HIV. So that's where the plus and the minus sign came from. So that's kind of what brought me, like how I met um, the team who hired me, like my supervisor, Rocco, that's how he knew me from that friendly campaign. Okay. Very cool. And, and I and I hear you have a beverage as well. I do. Um, I'm 15 years sober, but I do enjoy um, just like interesting beverages just to kind of mix things up a little bit. And this one's called Hop. It's a zero alcohol drink, 
but um, it's got a nice little fizz to it. It's just, it's a sipper. So cheers. Cheers, indeed. Clink. <laughs> All right. So yeah, so basically, I mean, we're talking a little bit about World AIDS Day as a way. And so that was December 1st. Um, and you know, it's so funny because as I was going through Facebook, I keep throwing up those memories and things. Yeah. And last year at this time, we were actually doing a project with the Burton Bar Library downtown and Arizona Department of Health called Paws Phoenix. And so we did a drag show with the library. We had a panel of entertainers from the 80s talking about the response of the entertainment community to HIV and in and, and the 80s and kind of what it what it was like at that point. It is amazing to me just how um, how many agencies are working with this population. So just a variety of services and um, kind of like how Southwest Center fits in with all these agencies. I mean, we are the fifth largest city in the United States. So yes, we need to have multiple agencies to reach people. E exactly. I mean, and so many museums, I mean, take and make themselves dark. I mean, their logos, things like that as a way to just show support. Sure. So, yeah. All right. So now we normally do trivia, which we are going to do. And so our trivia is a little unique because instead of it being all about what you don't know, we're going to go through our questions. And then at the end, we'll take a little bit of a music break. And tonight we actually have music, which is kind of exciting. and. Then we'll go through the answers and explain them. And that's always the fun for me because that's where the stories come out and you'll be able to kind of grasp all kinds of history across the country as well as Arizona. All right. So you can keep tabs of your answers either in the chat. Um, I know I have one person who likes to just use a magic marker and their leg to keep track of theirs. So whatever makes you happy, feel free to do that. All right, so our first question, World AIDS Day takes place on December 1st every year and was founded in A, 1985, B, 1988, C, 1995, or was it the year 2000? What year was World AIDS Day founded? And what year did the AIDS ribbon first appear at the Tony Awards? With a big splash. So was that A, 1988, B, 1991, C, 1995, or B, 1998? When did the AIDS ribbon first appear? And it was at the Tony Awards. One of the first presenters at the Tony Awards to wear the iconic AIDS ribbon symbol was A, Jeremy Irons, B, Tom Hanks, C, Elton John, or D, Clint Eastwood. Which one of those celebrities was the first presenter to wear the red ribbon? Cleve Jones created the first panel of the AIDS Memorial Quilt. He and several others formally organized what organization back in 1985? A, ACT UP, B, Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, C, Names Project Foundation, or D, Broadway Cares. So from that first panel of the AIDS quilt, a group of folks formed what organization? And how many panels make up the AIDS Memorial quilt? A, 5,000, B, 18,000, C, 25,000, or D, 48,000? How many panels are there in the current AIDS Memorial Quilt? 
seems like any one of those answers would be impressive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The AIDS Memorial Quilt is the largest piece of community folk art in the world. And as of 2020, it weighs in at A, four tons, B, 18 tons, C, 30 tons, or D, 54 tons. Again, any of those is quite a sizable tonnage. Each AIDS quilt panel measures three feet by six feet to represent what? A, a portrait, B, a church window, C, a city building in San Francisco, or D, a coffin. What does the what do the panels represent in the AIDS quilt? Question eight, coming into the home stretch. Keith Herring is a famous artist and HIV activist. He is known for creating art with the following slogan. A, silence equals death. B, fight AIDS. C, act up. D, all of the above. Keith Herring was known for creating art that had which of those slogans? What animal was prominently featured on Keith Herring's Phoenix mural? A, an octopus, B, a snail, C, a gorilla, or D, an eagle? Which one of those images was on Keith Herring's mural? Right here in downtown Phoenix. And our last question, the Southwest Center tested over 9,000 people in 2019. This agency began in the year 1990 and was first known as what? A, body positive. B, the Parsons Project. C, Joshua Bush. Or D, the Center on Central. What was the original name back in 1990 of the Southwest Center? All right, so before we get to the answers, as you're all trying to recall, oh, wait a minute, did they give a clue away in one of those answers? Let me, oh darn, my Sharpie and my leg ran out. Um, so we're gonna take a little bit of a music break. And so we are gonna talk about a gentleman that I know I've seen playing around in a lot of different places. He has been, so Kenny Thames grew up in Texas, wound up here in Phoenix, actually Glendale, graduated from Glendale High, and then went off and became pastor of several churches in Texas. Then kind of had a change of life and came back to Phoenix and literally started from scratch. Because he had grown up in such a, in the, in the, in the church, he really only knew gospel music and not much else. But he was, and still is, a great piano player. And so he wound up getting a job playing at a bar here in town called JC, JC's Fun One. Initially, he then got a job at Winx. And then someone invited him to karaoke. And so he wound up eventually playing karaoke, but he didn't have any of the music background. So what he would do is he would tell people, oh, you know, write that song down for me and I'll bring, I'll make sure and bring it next week. And that's what he would do is he would go off and then learn these songs over the week and then come back and play them for folks. Now, Kenny also um, does a variety of jazz in bars around town, as well as he got hired on as the main pianist for the Paradise Valley Country Club. And so he went for the audition and they loved him. There was a woman there who kept asking him to play music from the Guire sisters. And now he knew this only because his mom went 
no one else was around, she would pull out Maguire sisters records and play them. And so he did know that music. And that woman was Dorothy McGuire, who had been one, who was one of the McGuire sisters. And so he got the job and still is the pianist for the Paradise Valley Country Club. And we actually have, and he also writes music, teaches what well, he has his own inst music academy with several other teachers um, doing virtual classes, as well as he has an 80 year old student who said, I want to learn piano. And for the last four years has been diligently practicing and playing the piano, which I think is really kind of nifty. And so here is a performance of one of Kenny's original songs. And we do indeed have the rights to play this. He told me so himself. So this I wrote, this is this I wrote for people who you go through breakups and you're glad. Sometimes you you know all the crying your beer songs. Well, one of my breakups, my first one, it wasn't a crying your beer, it was thank God and Greyhound, they're gone. So that's where this came from. F Said you were leaving, you're gone, I didn't believe it, you're gone, baby, 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 you're gone, you're gone and I ain't sighing, you're gone and there's no crying, you're gone. was bare out to the garage and your car wasn't there there's no messages on the phone thank god thank god you're gone you're gone you're gone i'm glad you're free you're gone i can finally be me you're gone y'all ah indeed i love it when we actually get a chance to play music so very good all right well we're about to embark on some of the answers are you I ready that, uh, might be a great theme song for 2021 like 2020 you're gone you're just gone Oh, indeed. Hello, 2021. <laughs> All right. So World AIDS Day play, takes place every December 1st and was founded in B, 1988. Wow. Yeah. So like the, the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, first discovered in 81. And then remember... They weren't sure what to call it. So for a while, it was called GRIDS. Do you remember that? I do. Gay-related immune disorder, because it was first showing up in uh, homosexual men. And then AIDS wasn't coined until 82. And then 
oh, we need to raise more awareness about this. So that's why World AIDS Day was created in 85, not 88. <laughs> yeah. And it's the first ever global health day. Because oh. the so that's why the world, because like from, you know, um, 82, 85, it was starting to spread worldwide. And then we needed to raise awareness worldwide about it. So I say we as if I'm the one who came up with it. <laughs> but it was important to raise awareness worldwide. Right. Because, I mean, it still is very much affecting the entire world. Absolutely. All right. And, you know, and I forgot what year this was. So what year did the AIDS ribbon first appear at the Tony Awards? 1991. And I remember those 20 awards, just like, what is that AIDS ribbon about? You know, um, having grown up like out East, it was, it was just, it was just all we could talk about, right? There's just uh, what's going on and how is this being spread? How is this being passed around? And we still needed to raise more awareness because, you know, it just wasn't, it just wasn't, um, research wasn't happening as much. There still was no cure or treatment yet. In right. 1991. So we still need to um, raise awareness, and it really affected the the artist community. Um, so, so I think that's one reason why, um, you know, uh, Broadway Cares and Equality Fights AIDS got together uh, with Visual AIDS, and then they created that that AIDS ribbon. And back then, it was this was something I learned in just researching for the show. Was was the picture of it was like, it was tightly. Um, put together like a V, like an upside down V. Right. And I think it actually, I think it actually is the next question where we actually see that original ribbon, which we were both kind of surprised by. Yeah. 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 So question three was, well, is. who yep. was the first presenter to wear the iconic lead ribbon? And it was Jeremy Irons. And if you look, it's not that ribbon shape that we all know, but it was in what shape? Like that upside down V to raise awareness for the virus. Yeah. And then Which it just I, became a ribbon, right? Right. And I always thought this, the AIDS ribbon was like the first ribbon. Um, but the AIDS ribbon was kind of, kind of came um, the fir the ribbon before that was the yellow ribbon. And I remember the yellow ribbon people tied around their trees or around their lamp post. Right. Uh, for the, um, and that was for the Gulf war for, um, to be, raise awareness about the needs of Gulf War veterans and people coming home from the Gulf War. Um, so then the AIDS ribbon was the first ribbon ever worn. And that now, like, how many ribbons are there, right? To raise awareness. It's just, it's awesome. Right, exactly. I mean, and, and it all kind of started with this. And then it's like, it just kept getting kind of different organizations that, hey, you know, that's such a great visual. Yep. That's easy to put together. And so... Yeah. Oh, my goodness, I love Jeremy Irons. Um, the M Butterfly oh, was such an amazing movie. Right, had revisited. I'm like, what, what an amazing actor. All right. So Cleve Jones created the first AIDS Memorial quilt. And then him and several other folks created back in 85, the Names Project Foundation. Now, um, he spent a lot of time here in Phoenix, but it, he got a little tired of being such a small town. And so he then moved to San Francisco and wound up becoming part of the Harvey Milk Circle. And um, several years ago, wrote a book called When We Rise that actually became a TV miniseries a couple of years ago, which is pretty exciting. But it's hard to think that the Names Project really kind of started back in the mid 80s. And it started just as like a, a very, um, a, a protest, right? Just to raise awareness. Hey, you know, people are, people are dying and we need to, we need to get more involved. It was, it was affecting mostly, you know, um, men who have sex with men, injecting drug users. So it wasn't a very, you know, popular <laughs> disease for lack of a better word. Um, it was just, it was hard. It was like, there's this wave. And I just, rem I remember feeling that. Um, just like, you know, this, this feeling, well, well, people deserved it or, um, 
they they had it coming a little bit you know there's so i think the stigma um around hiv really um dug in deep back then that um that it's people had it coming i just remember hearing that all the time and then being from Indiana, it was kind of like with um, Ryan White. Suddenly you said had this whole other side now coming out and education suddenly became very different at that point. And that's kind of where when I started getting really passionate about it. My my degree is in secondary education. So it was I've always been about like teaching, uh, teaching about HIV and raising awareness about HIV, because when you explain the facts to people, and it's it's there's really it's really about adjusting misinformation or um, helping educate somebody about um, about HIV. My my father um, he's retired now, but uh, was an emergency room physician, so he was you know working the emergency room throughout all this, and and he um, he always just kind of taught me that like Dave, it's a disease, it is not you know it is a virus, and this is how a virus acts. So I'm always raising awareness about it. It is, you know, it is a virus that affects the immune system. So um, we know, we know how it is spread. And we're still raising awareness about that. You know, we still have people that think you can get it from hugging or, you know, we still have clients um, that, that say their, their parents, their parents or the people they live with make them eat off of separate dishes. You know, they have, we have, I have my own set of dishes and my own set of utensils, and then we can go into the family and explain to them, you know, that's, we don't need to worry about that. You know, um, we don't need to make somebody feel less than for having, um, for, for, for having this virus. Right. No, nope, very much so. I mean, we've come a long way, but there's still more ways to go. So how many panels make up the AIDS quilt? It's wow. 48,000. Um, mm. And these quilt panels are available. They used to all be stored in one place, but now it's too big. So they have different places um, store store some of the quilt panels so that um, people can borrow them and use them for displays. It comes with the, the names project comes with like a whole set of rules on how to do this. And I'm, I'm always wanting to like, hey, let's bring an AIDS cool panel to this event. Um, so we can, and, they, and it's done all by for free. Um, you don't have to pay money to, to borrow one. So if somebody wants to, hey, I want to do an, an, aware, an event to raise awareness about HIV, I can obtain one of these panels. Um, and then there's all kinds of rules about how do you treat them, how you take care of them. You, you don't want to put them in a plastic bag. You know, the, right. you want to let them breathe. Um, so that they last for a long time. Um, but but this is a really nice thing. So like, you know, if any of your viewers are like, hey, I would love to have an AIDS school panel at, at you know, maybe a display at my church or at my school, um, you can definitely look into it about having having that done and um, getting picking one up, putting it on display. You can even pick which panel you'd like to have on display. Wow. Isn't that cool? Like, so in storage, they're all numbered. And when you go to aismemorial.org, you can like look at um, each panel is numbered and you can and it shows up in a picture. Um, so it's it's really, wow. it's really amazing the technology that they've used. Um, yeah, and I know I know like the city of Phoenix um, has had them down at City Hall. Um, I know Aunt Rita's gets them sometimes for Red Brunch. Yep. Um, and so we actually then had that one on display last year at the library from Aunt Reed as well. So yeah, I mean, I love the fact that you're able to get them to display. That was my first event in Phoenix was um, coming to the, the Parsons Center and in the big open room where the, you know, where the choir practice, um, they, um, they had, I think, 12 panels on display. And oh, it just took my breath away just walking in and you just see all these, all these people's lives uh, on display. Right and all the love and care that goes in each of those panels. Right, and, and really the opportunity to give um, some of those folks closure about saying goodbye to someone. Yep. So yeah, so I mean, it's, it's very an important part of the whole process.
All right. The AIDS Memorial Quilt is the largest piece of community folk art in the world. As of 2020, it weighs in at what? Can you believe it's 54 tons? That's incredible. I mean, I've lugged them around in my car before, so I know they're heavy. <laughs> they are indeed very heavy, but 54 tons is extremely heavy. So just like one panel, um, one square is consists of like eight panels. So it totals like 12 by 12 feet. Um, but they're also, you know, so all of them are sewn together, but, um, and then they're framed and they're backed. Um, so it's really, it's really impressive how well they're taken care of. Mm -hmm. it's, I believe it truly honors, um, it honors World AIDS Day. It honors the people that we've lost to, to HIV related, HIV AIDS related causes. Right. All right. So each AIDS quilt panel measures three by six feet to represent. And this is where they came up with those dimensions. It's about approximately the size of a coffin. So when Cleve Jones first was raising awareness about it, like in, in San Francisco, they created these quilt panels and they would, you know, they'd have um, um, events where they would just lay down and then just kind of like uh, sit-ins or die-ins where they would just lay down. So then they, they created panels for people that couldn't be there anymore. So then, so that would be the size of them so that they could, so they could lay out these bodies or these like coffin shaped for representing the people that couldn't be there. So okay. Lay out these coffin sized panels uh, uh, out in places to just show, look how many people we've lost. Wow. It's just so powerful. Indeed. All right. Keith Herring is a world famous artist as well as was an HIV activist. And he's known for creating art that had the following slogans. And this really kind of sums it all up right here in this one piece. Isn't it amazing how true it still is today that ignorance does equals fear, that silence does equal death. And it is time for us to still, we still need to act up and fight AIDS. Right. There's still so much we can do. Exactly. And that's why we're doing this exact thing right now is just so that way people get to hear about it. And and I think it's actually really cool that we're also being able to share some of that history. Because a lot of people don't necessarily even know the history of like World AIDS Day or the ribbon or even, I mean, like ACT UP, which was a group of activists that would meet at the Gay Community Center back in New York and would have these huge shouting matches in terms of what to do. I was, um, we, with the team friendly campaign, we marched in the New York city pride parade and we, um, re, um, we reenacted some of the same shouts that, that, um, act up did back then we would do the who'd shout down the street. We had a, we reenacted a, a die in, you know, where we all just kind of like, um, laid down and we we're silent for five minutes. Um, it's just so powerful to, to still, um, be doing some of that same activism that was so necessary in 1989, because it is still, um, you know, there is no cure for HIV. Uh, right. You know, treatment is amazing. We have preventative ways that are amazing, but you know, it's still, we still need to continue the funding for it. Um, and we still need to raise awareness about it. Right. All right. What animal was prominently displayed on Keith Herring's Phoenix mural? And it was a gorilla. Um, and actually next week, we actually have an artist on who actually became friends with Keith Herring when he was here in the mid 80s, painting the mural and developed a really close friendship with him. So we're going to talk about kind of the anniversary of that of the mural, kind of the story about what happened to it as well as kind of, in a lot of ways, this, I think, started a lot of what we're seeing now in downtown, Roosevelt Row, 63, the power of murals. And also, the, like, the power of just art, to make a statement through art, um, to, to, and then right. getting so many people involved in the art. 
you know, it's not just an art created for yourself in your own world, but, you know, just to really make a statement in a mural is just so, so moving, so powerful. Phoenix has amazing murals. We we do indeed. I mean, we're kind of a hotbed of murals right now. Where it's like so many other cities were overrun in the 80s, which we didn't happen. I mean, we had, Keith Haring was really kind of the first one to paint a mural. But, you know, I don't want to I don't want to take away too much thunder from next week. But. All right. And then our last question, the Southwest Center tested over 9000 people in 2019. This agency began in the year 1990 and was first known as. As body positive. And, you know, and one of the things I thought was really interesting, which I could, I didn't remember what the original logo for body positive was and how close the, the fact they incorporated in that hand, that same figure. That same reaching up figure. Yeah. And there's a sculpture outside our building that has a similar, similar, the reaching up right outside the front, right on Central Avenue. Oh, is that light rail? Yes. Right on the light yeah, rail. Yeah. So that's released the fear. So that's Robert Miley. Um, and so Robert does a lot of work with youth who have been involved with gun violence. And so that's made out of melted guns. Very cool. So, but yeah, I mean, it's like, I mean, it's like, I mean, when you see that, it's like throwing up the hands in exhilaration, going to give you a hug. I mean, it's such a great body posture because it's so positive. In terms of just, I think of it like as a child reaching up, like mom, pick me up. It's the first thing when I saw, when I saw it, it was just like somebody reaching up, like not, not like out of desperation, but out of joy. Right. Very much so. So tell us a little bit about Southwest Center and some of the things you all are doing, especially in this time where not a lot of people are congregating with each other. We, um, we have been working hard at moving so many of our services online. Um, so, you know, we do navigation services um, and we focus on helping people who are disproportionately affected, right? So like, um, uh, and we've, we've, we've focused a lot on the LGBTQ plus community and um, because it's a disproportionately affected community. Right. And um, we also focus on reaching services for people of color, which is also a disproportionately affected community. And we are happy to say how many of our services that we offer um, in English and Spanish. And we also have two people on staff who are fluent in uh, American Sign Language as well. Um, so we uh, service the community um, in multiple ways. Uh, but we have navigation services for uh, people living with HIV. Uh, we've got case managers that really help connect people to care. And it like um, we, <laughs> I took place in the support group. Um, we had a guest speaker, Mark Esking, who is a longtime HIV activist. And he's like, you know, today is the best day you could test positive for HIV. And like we all we all kind of reacted. He's like, what? And he's like, because the treatments are so amazing now. You know, like like the life expectancy for somebody who's diagnosed with HIV, if they get on their meds, their life expectancy is the same. Right. And at one time it was a death sentence. Right. Very now, much. You know, right. So now um, people are living long, happy, healthy lives living with HIV. We just got to, you know, provide it and make that convenient to get tested so that people can know. Right. right. Um, so that's the other. Um, we also so we, we also want to help prevent HIV. So we have PrEP case managers, uh, PrEP navigators, and PrEP is a daily pill that prevents HIV. And we offer those like counseling sessions. Um, I chat a lot online and just talk to people um, all over Arizona to, um, to help refer people to uh, pre our PrEP navigators, to help them gain access to a daily pill that prevents HIV. And it's, it's so exciting um, to be able to connect somebody like if, you know, um, to be able to prevent it. Um, we also offer trans health care. So we have um, okay. a couple people on staff that uh, focus on trans health care and uh, referrals to for people. Um, and it's, it's just an amazing service because they're uh, just so smart. There's so much I'm still learning about um, 
people who are, you know, um, discovering their gender and uh, coming to, you know, making, being at one with their gender. Um, it's, it's, right. it's, it's really amazing service. Well, we have a life coaching for people uh, living with, um, for people of any status, actually. Um, just to, you know, how like uh, sometimes LGBT youth can be kind of questioning and struggling. Um, so we have like trained life coaches to help them uh, problem solve. And then you're familiar with the T, right? So mm -hmm. the T and is the uh, yeah. um, So how did you get involved with the T? So, you know, I mean, so I do a lot of just kind of talking about history. Um, one piece of that is I was talking about LGBTQ history here in Arizona. And so Andrew said, hey, you know, why don't you come talk to kind of the core group of T? And I mean, it was like, and not this year, but I think last year we actually did like a Thanksgiving. And so, which was really fun to be sitting at a long table and just kind of just randomly chatting. That's awesome. Um, we, yeah, I mean, we did movie nights um, with Sister Sermon from their Sister Privilege Indulgence, kind of talking about the movie, um, having a discussion afterwards. Um, I can remember, oh gosh. So when Andrew was first setting up the tea, um, when you you know when you walk in his room and there's that big wall of books, those all came from the BJ, BJ Bud Library. Oh, very cool. And so he was like, can you help us start to pull some of the books that, because there's pallets and pallets of books, we know not all of them are stuff we need to have there. And one of the things they thought, they thought, well, you know, it'd be kind of cool to have some of these older books on HIV and how do people deal with it? And I was like, no, do not put that stuff out because if somebody picks up a book from 82 and reads something that's very false. Right. We don't need to be putting out misinformation. So no, only current books from a medical standpoint. If it's a history book, that's one thing that's different. But from those medical books, no, not at all. So much has changed in, in HIV science. Like, I mean, we didn't have the cocktail. Like, um, we, we know now that it takes like multiple medications for um, at, at the same time to, to treat HIV successfully. But it wasn't until 95 that the, the cocktail happened when that really changed that changed everything, uh, that, that it no longer was a death sentence for people who are diagnosed. Um, but now we know that when people achieve an undetectable viral load, that somebody living with HIV um, is treating their medication, treating their virus so well with their medication, they achieve an undetectable viral load. We now know that that is untransmittable. So right. even if they had sex without a condom, I mean, one couple I worked with, they were ecstatic when I explained to them and I showed them how the charts and, you know, like if you're treating it well, your viral load is so small that you can't transmit the virus. And they looked at each other and they're like, they've always thought they couldn't have kids. And now they know that they can have kids. Uh, and it's just like the, the, just the joy um, right. and just the, of just knowing that, that they can now consider having children. So what it was just, I was like, what, a, what an honor to, to be able to tell them that and help them come to that conclusion. Uh, it was just amazing. That's really cool. Um, but everything that you talked about, you did with a T, you did online, right? So it was all- No, that, actually, this was all pre-COVID. It was yeah, all before all of this. It was pre-COVID. It was actually face-to-face. -face. Okay, cool. So I know Andrew's been doing a lot of stuff virtually. Yep. So those That's movie all. nights are still happening. Where they so they watch a movie and they watch it all together on Facebook and then they all can chat in the comment section. Actually, I, I did some of those with them as well. So yeah, yeah it was, which awesome. was a lot of fun because it's it kind of like the elder. <laughs> I was the elder. So I mean, I, I would like throw in like arcane comments and things. <laughs> and be like, what does that even mean? I know. So then I have to like go through and dissect what I had just said and said, well, here's it's like uh, you know here's this term and. So <laughs> I know sometimes I feel my age so hard, you know, most of my team is in their twenties, you know, and, and I make some kind of reference and just like, Oh, they haven't, do they have any idea what I'm talking about? Right. Like, like a friend of Dorothy, <laughs> which was, I mean, which was code a long time ago to find out if someone was gay or not. But nowadays it's kind of like, Oh, now but I am thrilled. Like, like, if I quote something from 
Golden Girls. They all know we <laughs> like Golden Girls is still relevant today. You know, oh, we watch Golden Girls before we go to bed. I'm like, oh, thank goodness. You know? <laughs> well, see, I'm glad some some things do transcend. <laughs> yeah. And the Golden Girl is a good one to do just that. Very much so. Like, I could watch that show with my mom. And it was so cutting edge back then. It is still relevant today. It and really I, is. HIV on that episode, Rose was the one who was potentially exposed to HIV and went through the scare of testing and, and the support that they gave to each other. It was just right. oh, it was a beautiful episode. Yeah, I mean, they were really able to tackle some really hard-hitting topics, but do it with such love, care, care, and finesse. Such a good show. Yeah. So um, we are offering all those services that I mentioned online, including, um, you know, we have behavioral health, we have counselors that are, that are offering services online, which is really amazing. Um, and, but we still, uh, we now have opened for our, our clinic is now open. We still offer services. Um, we do um, telemedicine with our clinic and we also do teletesting where we'll mail you an HIV test. And this is anywhere in Arizona. So this has been really amazing because we are able to serve like small town Arizona. Right? Uh, like we can just mail something to somebody. We can set up a one-on-one -on -one um, appointment so we can like kind of walk them through that test so people don't have to take that test alone and they can you know we can interpret the results together and you know how you have to like you have to read a manual like who wants to read the directions <laughs> you know it's complicated is it complicated it's not that complicated but when you have somebody right there with you talking you through it it just it just makes that experience really amazing our testers are off are, are awesome yeah, no, I I agree. I mean, everyone I've talked to has had a great experience, and then I just love all the testing that's going on. So that way, it's easy and anonymous to still get tested. So yeah, that's great, and that someone's holding your hand for that. Very much so. The results and holding your hands in cyberspace, you know. Right. Oh yes. <laughs> so um, we did get a new grant. Also, um, we have an employment specialist for the LGBTQ community. Um, Hakundo is awesome and he, to, he works one-on-one -on -one with people to help them build a resume, help them train them for an interview, train them to how to do an online interview, you know, because it's, it's different. It's how to sell different. yourself online. And we're helping get people find jobs right now. So it's wow. a really awesome service. And he's really good at it. Excuse me, I believe his pronouns are they. So they, um, are um, they are really helping people uh, access um, employment opportunities. Nice. That's great. And then the other really big um, part of part of our program is a campaign called nice package where we ship condoms to people. And we've been, this program is, has been, you know, happening uh, for, you know, many years and, but now due to COVID, um, a lot of places where people could access free condoms are not available. So we now, we ship condoms anywhere throughout Arizona and Southern Nevada. We ship condoms for free. People can go to our website, nice package. Wow. And we ship condoms to them and they can pick from, we have 27 different cho choices. It could be little combo packs or internal condoms, you know, flavored condoms you know, colored condoms, like any kind of condom you can imagine. Um, and we ship them to people for free. And this has gone <laughs> skyrocketed in popularity due, due to COVID. I can only imagine, especially in um, some of those smaller places where you might not want to go out and acquire. Right. Um, and then also people's budgets are stretched. Well, you know, if I can get a condom mailed to my door for free, without risk of me leaving my home, without, you know, me needing to like pay for anything. Um, and it is just a click of a button, send us your address, pick what you want, and we ship it to you. We've gone from like about 250, 300 pa packages a month, which I thought was a lot when I joined Southwest Center. We're shipping out 300 packages a month, you know, <laughs> that's like 10 a day, you know, um, but now we're shipping over a thousand packages per month. Um, wow, that's great. Packages of condoms shipped to people's homes for free. It's in a discreet envelope. Um, and it's just, 
Um, it's it's really an impressive service that Southwest Center offers. I'm I'm proud to be part of the team. My 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 little part in the team. No, that's great. So how? So what is the website someone should go on to to? Um, well, all of this is you can find everything um, through swcenter.org. Okay, um, but specifically look for nice package. But if, so if you if you look for a nice package, like I have to put a big shirt, nice package dot org. Yes, nice package dot org. Um, oh wow, that's own little moniker. Very cool. So it's got a little box with a smile on it. It's a discreet package that that comes to your door. And I always tell people just like, hey, you know, I think everybody knows somebody who could use a free condom, right? It's a great way to just start a conversation, a real, you know, let's sit down and let's talk. So maybe maybe it's a way to start a conversation with somebody just like, hey, maybe you need these. Maybe you know somebody who needs these, you know? Um, maybe you know, just this website, we have all different sizes of condoms. Like, uh, like for example, Magnum condoms, they're pretty expensive, but when we buy them in bulk at a nonprofit rate, uh, you know? okay. um, so people can get the condoms that they want uh, for free. Nice. That's really cool. We're, we're proud of, we're proud of what we do. We are, a <laughs> we are a, a grant writing fulfilling machine here at Southwest Center. <laughs> we do our best to like meet all of our outcomes and we work with our funders, you know, the CDC, you know, funds most of what we do as does the state, you know, uh, Arizona Department of Health and Human Services, they fund us as well. Uh, so we, um, you know, we do a lot of our grant reports and we're really proud of the work that we do. And um, I think our, our funders are really proud of how much we're still able to do even during COVID. You know, we do prep by by online meetings and you know we do trans healthcare by online meetings um so it's really you know the t is doing you know the group meetings they did a campaign right. their campaign that they did uh, they did a campaign called um don't stop talking sex and and that campaign just involved so many of the the members and that was featured in the the u.s conference on hiv aids Oh wow! Because it was so powerful and so impactful and so popular with um, uh, the Latino youth that that um, that people got so many people got involved in that. Uh, so it was really it was really cool. I was really proud of Andrew and the team. Yeah, I mean it's such a great team. I mean I I love the close community that he's developed with all those folks. Yeah, it's anytime I participate in an event with them, you can just feel the camaraderie. And then the newcomer is welcomed. Uh, so, right. yeah. And there's some um, the great events that are coming up too. Uh, we have, um, well, we're participating in Red Brunch is on Saturday. So Aunt Rita's puts that on. And that was my first big event last year. So I'm really excited to do that um, in Cyberland this year. And Greg Luganis is going to be one of the featured speakers. Oh, so wow. Luganis is... Um, you know, the, the Olympic diver that won, I don't know how many gold medals, um, but he's going to share his story. And then we're also really excited about an event that we're teaming up with one in 10. We partner with a lot of agencies here. We're teaming up with one in 10 to put on um, an event called Chosen Family, where we're delivering meals to people's homes. And it's for youth ages 13 to 24. And this has taken place on Friday, the 17th or 18th of December. Okay. And we have, um, we have some uh, like classes that, you know, what, so while they're eating, they're enjoying their meal with their chosen family, they um, can enjoy, um, we're having a couple of drag shows um, and we're having um, Angina, which is uh, one of the- Oh, right, from RuPaul's Drag Race. RuPaul's Drag Race. And Angina is one of the first um, reality stars to come out as living with HIV and has been a long time HIV activist. Right. Uh, and she's fabulous. And when, you know, when I contacted her um, um, through her manager, the manager was like, oh, this is exactly the kind of thing that Ajana loves to do. So um, it was really quick to, um, to say yes, which was uh, so heartwarming um, that, that we were able to get Ajana to be part of this event. Now, um, you had mentioned when you talked a little bit about Joshua Tree. Yes. 
that was one of the fake names I came up with is Joshua Bush. <laughs> right. <laughs> so yes, Joshua Tree is an agency that we partner with often um, because they they um, are a food service and they also have like um, other like home home healthcare supplies. So, um, but they they're open and it's free to the public in downtown Phoenix where uh, people they they focus on serving people living with HIV. So, and I've been to there. I volunteer there for some. And uh, it's just amazing the fresh produce that they get in, um, everything that they have, they've stored in freezers so that people can have also sometimes prepared meals. Um, and they've also expanded their um, services for not just people living with HIV, but also for the trans community, for, for the trans community of any status, which is a disproportionately affected population. Right. So um, that, that they can offer um, um, free food there. So it's it's uh, Just for Trees, just an amazing organization. Um, they are indeed. Yeah, we, we're we're proud to partner with them and refer people to them. Very good. Well, Dave, thank you so much for basically almost celebrating your one year anniversary at Southwest Center with us. This is pretty awesome way to spend an anniversary in one year here. <laughs> yeah. No. Thank you so much for sharing your experience as well as some of that history of just the HIV culture that well, some people might not have been aware of. I am so, I mean, some of this was really cool. Like I learned from you, I learned from doing research for getting ready for tonight. Um, and I even learned a little bit about history of Southwest Center where I've worked for just a year now. Right. So it's pretty cool. This has been, Marshall, you're awesome. You make this Oh, fun. you are as well. Thank you you're, so much for being you, here. Sure. I look forward to we can sit down and sip some lemonade on the same porch swing. That sounds great. And just chatting away. And I can't wait to give you not a cyber hug, but a real hug. Indeed. Look forward to that as well. I'll be taking that vaccine. I'll be taking the vaccine probably live on Facebook just to raise awareness about the importance of a vaccine. Right. <laughs> Understandable. Cool. So you have a great rest of your night. Likewise. Thank you again so much. Cheers. Oh, indeed. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Bye for now. All right. Well, I will ask some of you might not have wanted to, because you're like, well, you know, what's this show going to be like? How do I know? Maybe I don't want to share it. Well, you know, hopefully now that you've seen the happy hour, if you share it now, all your friends will be able to see all of gay of all of Dave's great information that he has to share about Southwest Center and just kind of that cultural aspect, not that not a lot of people are aware of the background of some of those things. So our next segment is actually sponsored by First Films Arizona. Um, you can find them on Facebook under First Films Arizona or their website, which is tffoa.org, and it is a segment called Little Arizona. So I always like to tell people that it's like, you know, I talk about how I lived in New York, but you know, I originally grew up in a town of 25 people in the Midwest in the little, in the middle of farm country. And so I always like to ask the guests, what small town do they like? And Dave mentioned, you know, not say a small town, but a place that's pretty darn incredible, Boyce Thompson Arboretum which isn't really that far away, but is really an amazing place. And so it gave me a chance to just kind of reflect, I mean, having taken family members there, my mother-in-law taking her there, and just being able to go and see the beauty of Arizona as you're driving out about an hour outside of Phoenix to go visit Boyce Thompson Arboretum, which, you know, I didn't realize is the largest and oldest botanical garden right here in Arizona. It was founded just after it became a state back in 20, in 1924, it was founded. And it has 390 plus acres of property that it sits on. It has a gift shop. They do a plant sale with all those plants. They have a sale. And so you can go buy a little seedling from some of those. They have a wide variety of trails 
And so some of them are a little more strenuous than others, but it's a really great way to just kind of get people to see the beauty of Arizona in a very safe, welcoming environment. I mean, look at how beautiful that is. And as you're going through, I mean, there are a variety of cactus gardens, eucalyptus groves, palm groves, an Australian exhibit, South, Af South American, so much. In fact, they have over 2,600 different species of arid desert plants that are growing out there. Hence why you might want to go out to when they do the plant sale, because it's pretty incredible. And they have Mr. Big, which is one of the largest red gum eucalyptus trees on the planet that you can go get a photo with Mr. Big. It's also known as a, rep a riparian zone. It attracts wildlife from all over the place. And there have been over 250 different bird species have been spotted there. And so as you're tromping around in all that beauty, you might wonder, how did this get here? Well, there's also, you'll see in the distance up on top of the hill is a castle. And so all this land, including that house, originally belonged to William Boyce Thompson, who moved here and was an engineer for the mines and became the founder of Inspiration Consolidated Copper Mine, as well as the Magnum Copper Mine out in Superior. And so he built that house, had all this land, and the house back in the 60s had a fire that destroyed, sadly, about half of the mansion itself. Now, when it was first built, it cost a million dollars to build this castle in the rock. Now, that was back in like 24 to 28. And he really picked the spot because it overlooked such beauty. In fact, he actually, his third story bedroom window, they actually had to do some blasting so he could get this picturesque view of Queens Canyon. Then the house sold back in 1946, became a variety of things, was an Airbnb, was a B and B for a while, was an event space, an RV park. And then in the late 2000s, Boyce Thompson Arboretum actually was able to acquire the house again. Since then, they've opened it up a few times for tours. I know I haven't been able to make it. I hope that some of you have been able to make it because I would love to see what the inside of that house looks like now. And so here's to 2021 and hoping that maybe a group of us can go out and enjoy that castle in the rock at Boyce Thompson Arboretum. So next week, as I mentioned earlier, we have such styles on, and we're going to be talking about murals as well as Keith Herring and his mural that he had in downtown Phoenix. We'll talk a little bit about what actually happened to that mural and why we don't really see it. And I'm happy to say we just confirmed we are actually going to be doing our New Year's Eve show on New Year's Eve at the same time that seven to eight will actually start a little earlier because we're going to be doing a tour of the Arizona Heritage Center on Papago Park. So looking forward to that, as well as we've got a whole month of great shows coming up. And, you know, we've been extended into next year, which I'm very excited about getting a chance to do that. And, you know, all of this only happens because of you all out there not just watching, but also some of you are donating and no matter amount, the amount, no amount is too small. Um, luckily, we do ha also have a sponsor in AARP Arizona, and they currently like to say, if you're looking for ways to stay active, healthy, and informed without leaving home, AARP Arizona has lots of online offerings and virtual get-togethers. Find out ways you can click to connect with your community at AARP dot org slash near you to find a variety of different events that they have that are virtual that you can click on a button and watch. So track some of those down and enjoy. Now, always remember, if you have any questions, stories, suggestions, or comments, you are welcome to throw them into the chat. 
as well as you can throw them into email or even reach out to me via my website. Now, even though we're all masked up and everything, um, I did doing a couple events actually this weekend. Um, we have over on Grand Avenue is a socially distanced market that is going on from 10 to 2, where I'll have such things as the Hip Historian activity book that kind of plays with that idea of when you would go into restaurants and get those placemats that you could color. It's that same type of idea. They make great stopping stuffers or even Hanukkah bush stuffers. Whatever you would like to stuff. Oh, never mind. As well as Festivus, which this year would have been its 11th year, is going on all virtual. So check out many of those vendors at hashtag Festivus 2020 and track down all that great local artists that you can support. I always like to give a shout out to my intro folks, my friend Cole and Chris, who did the music and video for that little intro for me, as well as thank you, PJ, for always helping to educate and lubricate, as well as then Mr. Ho for our outro music, who is a sunny slope boy with now his own orchestrotica happening out on the East Coast, but happily let me use some of his own written music to be able to share that with. So again, thank you all so much for joining. Have a great rest of your night, a great weekend. And I hope to see you here next week when we'll be talking about Keith Haring and murals.